Hey, what's going on, WBSC? The Whiskey Network is pleased to bring you another live tasting. Tonight, joining me is, as always, Bill Varnell, co-founder of WBSC, Cheers. and staff reviewer, Robert Diana. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a really killer time. Uh, we have a bunch of WBSC members, a uh, little tongue-tied already, participating with us, uh, they were selected through the Whiskey Network, uh, our weekly publication. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, tonight, we are gonna be reviewing Bardstown Bourbon Company. Uh, if you have any questions, post it in the comments section of the live feed. Uh, we'll get to them as, as time permits. Uh, tonight, we're featuring Bardstown Bourbon Company, located in Bardstown, Kentucky, bourbon capital of America. Uh, get there if you get a chance. Beautiful distillery. Great tour. Great place. Uh, tonight we have with us Nicholas Lewis and Sam Montgomery, National Brand Ambassador. My cheers. Cheers, Nick. Cheers, Sam. Welcome. Cheers, everyone. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yes, cheers. So, so you want to start us off with a little bit of a Bardstown Bourbon Company. Sam, would you like yeah. to, do you want to jump straight in and let's get this show on the road? Yeah, you betcha. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, super awesome to be here and, and you know, taste some, some bourbon with you guys and, and geek out. Uh, Bardstown Bourbon Company um, has been my, my home for about three years now um, and has just an incredible story. Um, you know, even just in the short time that we've been around, we've, we've been doing some pretty amazing things and has an incredible future. So I want to, before we dive right into the products uh, that uh, some of these folks are tasting, I want to give you a little bit of background on, on the company itself. So we were founded in 2013, 2014 by a man named Peter Lofton, who was a very successful business entrepreneur of, of many different uh, businesses. He uh, really wanted his, his dream job, his, his end goal, uh, you know, was to have his own bourbon brand. So he went out to Kentucky to try and find some bourbon to source, right? As, as many brands do before they have a distillery, they have to buy some bourbon and make some money before they start, you know, laying foundation. So when he went out to Kentucky, he was pretty uh, disappointed with the lack of, of options on uh, what was out there, what was available, and really couldn't find anything in Kentucky at all. Uh, but then, you know, kept moving a little bit further and found a ton of bourbon in Indiana. And he said, well, that's just ridiculous that we don't have something from Kentucky. So um, the idea kind of totally turned into something else. And he called up a few friends and started building uh, what became Bardstown Bourbon Company with the idea that, you know, we would kind of fill that gap in the market that, you know, that, that missing Kentucky bourbon that wasn't there that he was looking for, that we, we would provide that while we would also build our brand and our product, which we're getting ready to taste. So our first day of production was in September of 2016, which makes us four and a half years old. And at that point, we were producing 1.5 million proof gallons a year, which is, you know, not a humble start. It was a very strong start. But the, the, collaborative, uh, the collaborative distilling program, which we started with, uh, which is distilling custom product for all of those people looking for bourbon, right? Uh, was so successful that it allowed us to grow much quicker than we expected. Um, and we actually quadrupled our capacity in under three years and are now producing 7.2 million proof gallons a year. Uh, which makes us the uh, in the top 10 largest whiskey producers in the country, which is really impressive and unheard of in, you know, in, in the short time that we've been around. Uh, so Nick's got this, uh, that slide up there that kind of shows you just kind of what that looks like as far as growth. And, and it really is incredible. And it really speaks volumes to how big this bourbon boom is getting. And you guys uh, keep drinking it and more and more people want to make it, right? And what Bardstown Bourbon Company provides 
um, to those brands, you know, that, that want to start their own bourbon label is a chance to really own their product. So many of you know, it's, it's not easy. It's not cheap. I should say to, to build your own distillery, uh, that equipment, the energy costs, all of those things, tens of millions of dollars we're talking here. So, uh, what we provide is, is an easier start for a lot of these brands. So some of our, our clients include High West, Jefferson's, Bell Mead, Clyde Mays, Kentucky Owl, right? Uh, and some of those have distilleries, some of them don't at all. And what most, what most of these brands have to do is source bourbon, right? Source has kind of become an ugly word uh, to, to, to bourbon uh, geeks, bourbon drinkers, because it means you didn't make that juice. It just meant you bought it and you slapped your label on it, right? So keeping that in mind, we build our business model around the idea that these customers should be able to decide what their whiskey tastes like. So instead of just giving them, you know, like a menu, like a, like a, like a list that says, this is what we have, these are your options. We actually sit down with our collaborative partners, the brands that we distill for, and we say, what do you want your whiskey to taste like? Uh, where do you want your grains to come from? What kind of yeast do you want to use? How do you want your barrels to be charred? And it gives them the opportunity to really own that product. Uh, and, and, you know, I think we're really unique in the way um, our master distiller, Steve Nally, John Hargrove, our COO, Nick Smith, our head distiller, zero ego um, is, is in the picture when it, you know, when it comes to how these brands want their bourbon made. And those are those, those guys uh, amongst a few others on screen right there. Uh, Nick, John, and Steve are really uh, leading all of our operations. So, you know, the customer can use as little or as much input from our team members with the experience that we have with those guys and everybody that works under them uh, as they want. So they can say, hey, we really need your help or hey, this is exactly how we want our bourbon made and we just want you guys to do it. And, and we'll do that for them. So it's, it's, it's a win, 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 because it allows us to have this cash flow, this, this financial backbone that allows us to grow, expand, and really, really let our products sit and wait until it's fully ready to drink, right? We don't need to push anything out the door. It's great for those brands because now they have a chance to really have a unique product in their bottle, something that they can own. And it's great for you guys because hopefully in a few more years when we start to see those barrels that we put down in the beginning actually start going to bottle for these brands, you can see some transparency, you can see some variety, and um, I have a lot more options. You know, it's, it's promoting entrepreneurship in, you know, as far as bourbon brands go. So um, just a super cool thing that is a huge part of what we do that's not, that's not obvious when you, uh, uh, unless you hear it from one of us. So that's, we're thankful to, for this opportunity to talk to you guys about that and uh, welcome any questions about that uh, when we get to the, the Q and A part. So in the meantime, we are four and a half years old. We, we do have our own product line out there and we are super excited to share it with some of, the, some of you all that received these uh, tasting kits in front of you. Um, so, Without further ado, let's let's quit staring at the the bottles that are begging to be drank, and and let's start tasting. Uh, in the kits that you all have, there are four samples, and we're gonna go left to right, like read in a book, uh, starting with the first one that is labeled distillate, and is also the most identifiable because it has zero color, right? Which some of you might say, what's this here? Not bourbon. It is not bourbon. It's also not water. Uh, so please don't drink it as such. It'll be a sore mistake. Uh, so distillate is just kind of a, a simple term for what a lot of you have may have heard referred to as moonshine, white dog, white lightning, new make, any of those terms, right? Distillate is, is what we have to produce first uh, that we put into the barrel to become bourbon, right? And Nick Smith, our head distiller, has, has uh, these Nickisms, as I like to say, that you know, we, uh, you have to have good distillate to get to good bourbon, right? You got to start, start with the raw materials, good grains, make good distillate, good distillate makes good bourbon. And he will tell anybody that we have the best distillate 
of, of anybody in the business because we have really state-of-the-art equipment, you know, an advantage of building so new. We have a, a really experienced team and, um, and you know, we're, we're doing it right. So I'm, I'm not sure how many of you here have, have tasted distillate before, um, but gonna get a first impression right now. This is 60% corn, 36% rye, and 4% malted barley. This is what we would consider a high rye bourbon, right? We've got a corn, so we know it's a bourbon. It's more than 51%. And that rye being 36%, that's pretty high. Traditionally, it's between 10 and 15%. So we've got you know three times as much as the normal amount of rye. And it's going to really impact the flavor. So the first thing that we want to do is get a nose on it. And I'm, I'm sure this is common knowledge for a lot of you, but for those who haven't heard it before, you, you want to get a nose first. You want to keep the glass a few inches away. It is 120 proof, so you don't want to choke yourself with, with alcohol, right, on the nose. Keep your lips slightly parted, and having your mouth open will kind of help those alcohols kind of just come in and flow right out, and you'll get more of that grain character. And as you're smelling it, you should notice that there is a lot of character on here. A lot of us see something clear and expect it to be neutral, right, but this is grainy. This is corn forward. This has got um, some some definite character to it, right? And, you know, everything that we that we smell, taste, feel is only relative to our personal experiences. So we'd love to hear what you guys think about how everything that we're going to taste smells, tastes, uh, and don't be afraid to think that you might be wrong because it's what you're experiencing, it's there. Um, so tell us in the comments uh, if this reminds you of anything. A lot of people think, you know, cornmeal or uh, cornbread, corn pudding, right? Usually something with a pretty heavy corn component yeah. since we're, we've got bourbon here. Um, and then go ahead and Is take that, a taste when you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. And has anyone here not tried distillate before or do they not understand what we mean by distillate? Okay, that's awesome. Um, uh, Derek, you said it's your first time um, having not tried it before. So what's your thoughts? I'm intrigued. Uh, definitely picking up some sweetness, uh, both on the nose and, and the, the taste. Okay. Uh, picking up some of that rye spiciness as well. Okay. Yeah, uh, and Ken, let's just go for it. Um, this, is, this is incredible. I, I want a bottle of this. I, I don't want <laughs> as much as I want to try the, the next three. Um, I, I'm in love with this. This is fantastic. That's great. That's what we like to hear. Unfortunately, because this does get asked a lot, we have no plans to sell this. Uh, because even though it tastes great and we're happy that people love it, uh, it's going to taste even better. Uh, with some with some age in a barrel, so that's you know that's what we want to we want to do with with this stuff. But I'm glad to hear the the positive feedback. I know on the nose, so, definitely get a lot of sweet corn forwardness to it. Yeah, I can't get over that. It's almost like you opened up a can of sweet corn and you just catch that aroma. It's the same smell to me. I was just gonna that's say, it, I don't know the 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 middle mid Atlantic folks here, Bill, Chad, Derek. Uh, Sarah, y'all can understand this, but that Eastern Shore sweet corn, it's 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 got this absolutely. Uh, it's just got a right feel, a right taste to it. That's just very similar, very sweet, and it's it's really yeah. good. So I was fortunate enough, Bill and I were fortunate enough to take the tour with Nick Smith, and yes, we heard him say all those things you said multiple, multiple times, <laughs> yeah. and we got to take our hand into the the house and bring our own distillate out fresh off the uh, line. And in, in this glass, uh, this is one of my favorite glasses to use now. Uh, I, I get grandma's kitchen, uh, bake it for fresh cornbread, you, you know, some spices and all this goodness that you, you typically don't get a lot of, wow, this is kind of deep for white dog. And this is definitely a deep <clears throat> distillate that you have a lot going on. I also find it kind of um, surprising, you know, at least, you know, my, my first time tasting our distillate uh, with the company that 
there's some really good body on it. You think something like yeah. high proof that hasn't been in a barrel is just going to kind of like burn off your tongue, right? Like just kind of like dissipate, but you know, it, it's got some, some oiliness to it. It's got some body. It's a lot of viscosity to it without yeah. a doubt. Which is indicative of a lot of viscosity. So one can, you know, expect good body on it after it ages in a barrel yeah. and pulls all those, you know, sugars and, and char. And um, so, yeah, we, we taste the most distillate of, of anything else in the distillery. Like if you go into the lab or if you, you know, go into Steve's office or anything like that, what we're mostly tasting is distillate because we want to be able to catch problems early on. We want to make sure that we're starting with the best and we, you know, can assume that once that's in the clear, everything else is going to fall into place in, you know, in the barrel and as we blend and go to the bottle and stuff of that nature. So um, yeah, we taste a lot of distillate at the distillery more than any, more than anything aged, believe it or not. You know, the uh, high tech side of your distillery is pretty fascinating. Uh, as you were kind of alluding to earlier, uh, as Nick was walking us around the distillery, I mean, it was really surprised, like pinpoint precision on almost every single aspect that you do. As Nick just showed the, uh, the layout, it, it's really remarkable. Yeah, this is, um, so this is a screenshot of our software that we use in the distillery called uh, Ignition. And it is extremely beneficial to us and um, allows us to to keep track of everything that we're doing because one of the of one of the many things, but one of the biggest things that makes us very unique to any other distillery is how many recipes we produce. Because we're creating a custom recipe for so many clients, as well as doing a lot of innovative recipes for ourselves, uh, we are distilling more than fifty recipes. Fifty recipes is a is a lot. You know, Maker's Mark, which is one of my all-time favorites, you know, outside of Bardstown Bourbon Company, they make a, a fantastic product. They make one recipe. So when you think about it, every time they're dumping in the grain or they're grinding the grain or they're adding the water, they're heating up the water, everything is that to the same specs every single time where we are doing 54 recipes four times a year. We actually turn that over four times a year. So we really rely on that software to keep everything, to keep everything in control. And it allows Steve and Nick and John and, and as well as the, the clients that we're distilling for um, to be able to read that live feed of what's actually happening in, in real time from their phones so that they're, they're a part of the process. They know what's going on. They know when they're, when their juice is being distilled and they can see what's going on so there's no secrets there's no really huge leaps of faith they they have they have it right there to see what while we're cooking it so um really incredible and i really hope and, and encourage everybody to come out and see it for themselves uh when you have the opportunity to because it's a an amazing facility well, um, sam say something about that if i could sam and i visited uh, a few distilleries in my time and i said this to nick when we were doing the tour down there that is one of the most comprehensive distillery tours and one of the best distillery tours I've ever been on, bar none. Thank you. Hands down. Yeah. Hands down. I, as to piggyback on what Bill just said, uh, likewise, been on enough tours that I know what to expect typically. Uh, as soon as you walk, drive up to the property, it's it's really, you could honestly see it's, it's gonna be a whole new experience. It's fresh, it's new. Uh, you walk into doors and boom, you got this modern facility, not this. And I'm not knocking any of the old stories because they're of gorgeous course, yeah. in the history. But it's it's it was kind of like a breath of fresh air for me uh, when I went in there and it, it, immer, immer, immersive. It, it just start to finish. It was I was blown away. So I highly recommend any member of WBSE the if you're down there, definitely, definitely don't miss out on that one. 
Um, right. And a question is that we had um, from Christine earlier on is where we're talking about our collaborative partners. Um, do the collaborative, and Sam, I'm going to let you answer this. Um, do our collaborative brands identify our distillery on the bottles or is it just listed by region? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so as I've mentioned, we've only been distilling for about four and a half years. So all, like I would say much, more than 90% of what we've distilled for our clients is still and barrels. They haven't really seen a whole lot of that gone to bottle yet. The, the exception is um, chicken cock has a two-year rye uh, in the bottle that is 100% of our juice um, or what, you know, what we distilled for chicken cock. And I don't believe it is on their bottle. Uh, so, but but the, the, the real, the general answer is it's entirely up to the brand, right? Once once that distillate goes into the barrel and their brand name goes on the barrel head, they own it, they can do whatever they want to it. And we are completely out of that equation, right? Um, it's theirs to do what they want with it. Um, so it's uh, time will tell to, to see how many of them actually celebrate that on the bottle or how many of them um, do not. Uh, our hope is that you know, us kind of being the, the pioneers of transparency with, you know, our mash bills on the bottle and, you know, just the, the, the experience of, of when you come visit being very totally transparent that our brands can kind of help us celebrate that as well um, and put our brand on the bottle, but they don't have to. So it's kind of still TBD. Uh, Nick, I'm not sure if you know if, if Chicken Cog does put that on the bottle for us. I've I just checked. Short. I've just checked. Uh, no, it, it doesn't. It's uh, under spirits and grain. It doesn't even say Bardstown, Kentucky. Um, so they've just got it under yeah. uh, Kentucky for that. But I do think the culture of transparency is changing. And I think Bardstown Bourbon Company is holds a lot of responsibility for that. Uh, because the more we, we see the bourbon boom grow um, and the more it sticks around, um, the more educated consumers want to be right so uh, when there's a will there's a way and if brands you know if, 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 if a strong opinion but if brands were smart if they really wanted to build up brand loyalty they would be more transparent about what's in the bottle so um and we are seeing some brands kind of start to do that as well and and are happy to to be kind of leading that that movement of transparency so great Should question we move on to that um, should we move on to the matter? Yes. So sample number two is the bottle labeled matter it. And matter it is also maybe a word that you don't hear often. We kind of use very industry terms, um, but it's just a, it's a, just a barrel sample. So this is not something that has gone to the bottle yet. We haven't even pulled this juice out of the barrel entirely. Literally nothing, nothing happened to it other than taking it out of the barrel and putting it in that little bottle that you have in front of you. So there might even be some char, some floaty char bits in there, extra flavor, if you ask me. Um, we call that candy. Candy, yeah, char candy. Yeah. Uh, we, it's the same exact recipe as the distillate that you just tasted, um, but it's been in the barrel for three years. So right away you can see how much color it's grabbing and it looks wonderful. Um, and then go ahead and get a nose on it see how well uh, you know it's picking up that that barrel character just on the nose in three years it's not a super long time definitely oaks caramels starting to present themselves um, and then go ahead and taste it when you guys are ready start telling me anybody here on zoom uh, what you guys think about uh, three-year high-ride bourbon for a three-year it is unbelievably smooth um, I mean, I've, I've tried some very young bourbons and whiskeys and, and they've been very almost caustic um, with a really bitey. Um, mm -hmm. This is super smooth. It's got a, you can really, you, like you said, you can taste the caramels. You can, I, I get a little bit of cherry note on there. It's, it's actually really good. So I'm, I'm impressed for a three year. Great. It's already extracted a lot of the flavors out of the barrel, even for the three years. And as you said, uh, even the color is really come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a so amazing amount of char actually to it, which is, I, I personally love that. I like a good smoky whiskey. Mm -hmm. and, and for three years, I, there's a lot of barrel char in this, and that's, that's really cool. 
So I find within the, the from the distiller to the maturate, uh, you're still taking on a lot of the profile of the distillate, uh, and you retain the viscosity of it, which is really nice. And you're you're starting to really get into that nice beginning stages of a, a well developed whiskey with the uh, little bit of the char, the the smokiness, uh, the the caramels starting to pop you're still tasting the corn and, and a little bit of the rye and it really enhances that rye flavor uh that's coming through that you got on the distillate it, it's great mm -hmm. for being a three-year-old and like I say the viscosity just really stays with it which is awesome yeah i was gonna say that the uh, rye spices really come through after spending three years in that barrel and I, I posted a question in there and uh, was curious, and I wanted to ask this when we were down at the distillery, probably was told, but I don't remember. Uh, what's the char level you use on your barrels? Uh, so for this specific recipe, we went into a level three char. Uh, we have done some uh, level four on some big volume as well. And we've definitely done some really small isolated um, kind of experimental um, chars with combinations of either toasted and char three, toasted and char two. Uh, but for the products that we have in the bottle that we blend in fusion, we're using uh, char three. What is the, uh, what's the proof on this one? This is also, so uh, the distillate was 120 proof because that is exactly what our uh, barrel proof entry is. Um, and at three years, we didn't actually, um, you know, send this through the lab equipment to test the proof, but really generally in three years, it's maybe going to drop to like maybe 118, maybe 117, but it's going to be pretty close to that 120 because you don't see a whole lot of evaporation or, um, fluctuation in proof just yet. Um, so it's safe to assume it's, it's within three or four proof points of, okay. of, of its barrel proof entry. And the reason why I ask is that it, the, there's a noticeable difference in the heat between the first one, the clear, versus the, the matcher here. This is taking away that hot bite. Yes, the absolutely. Other one has. I, yeah, I, you... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you. Oh, I I just have to agree with I think with what Bill and uh, somebody else was saying. I can't. It, it's hard to imagine how three years how much the uh, the rye comes a lot a little more forward because I'm not getting that that sweet corn anymore and it's very nice balance right now even for a three year and I, I'm typically not a uh, a young bourbon liker I tend to find that they have a little more of the ethanol but I understand these are bigger barrels than most of the craft distillers use and so it's it's a little different but this is actually really a pleasure to to try and i actually find the the distillate sweeter and smoother than the three year mm -hmm. um but i like mellow corn too so maybe, <laughs> maybe that's why we won't hold that against you uh, uh, that's great that's good stuff so uh, what's really awesome about tasting this at three years old um is that this specific recipe um, and, and the same lot of barrels that we pulled these samples from is going to become our first core product, uh, in 2023, uh, when it is six years old. So, uh, the, the oldest barrels, uh, of this recipe are about four and a half years old. So we're only about a year and a half away till we think that they're ready to go into the bottle by themselves. And we'll, we will release that as our first core product in 2023. So this right here is giving you a sneak peek. And if you think it's great now, you're going to think it's awesome when it goes to bottle and you see it on the shelf. Uh, so keep that in mind. And, and now you can brag that you, you've kind of tasted, uh, you know, what's going to become Bardstown Bourbon Company's real workhorse, real flagship product in a couple of years before anybody else. So... Sure. Uh, Super. Question for you, real quick, Sam. Um, yeah. You say you're going to release the distillate as a new bottling, and mm -hmm. that the barrels are aged about six years. Is how did you guys come up with a decision to say let's stop it at six and go to bottling? It, it, was there a thought process to that? 
we really I... actually we really relied on Steve for that one actually okay. so most of the things that we do uh, everything that we do is is really a team effort and I will kind of um get into the get into that more when we talk about the blends of fusion and discovery but you know Steve having 49 years experience yeah. distilling uh you know we really we really needed a, a leader to say like hey when is since we are we have the opportunity to wait right because we we have our collaborative distilling program which allows us to you know keep keep the lights on if you will you know yeah. how long should we wait until we come out with a core brand and you know who would know it better than somebody in the game as long as him and he Absolutely. was very quick to answer very quick and confident to answer that he really okay. thinks that six years is when you six to eight years is kind of like a just a peak kind of flavor maturation for most bourbon recipes um nice. so we're we're leaning on him and it's still TBD, even though that's kind of the plan and the goal, a lot can change between then and now. I mean, we hope not. Uh, but if it's not, you know, tasting where it's at, if, you know, it's not happening in our rick houses the way we thought it would, then we'll wait a little bit longer. But um, judging by where some of the oldest barrels are at right now, everything is is pretty on par. Everything is kind of going uh, as as expected as planned. So uh, fully preparing to come out with that core product in 2023. Okay, thank you. I was real curious about that. Thank you. How often uh, do do y'all pull a taste from those barrels to judge when you think it's going to be at its prime? Well, uh, there's not a real strict um, you know, <laughs> schedule, but so many of us uh, around the distillery, it's 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 not. Um, it's not a rare occasion that that we get a little bored and say, let's go check on those barrels. Yeah. Um, so we, we taste the barrels often uh, between, uh, you know, most of our, our leadership and everybody that has access to the rickhouse where, you know, that's one of the biggest parts of the job is that we get to taste and, and decide and, and check in on barrels as they're aging. So um, there is a little bit more uh, from like Nick Smith, I would say. And, and John Hargrove, you know, cause there's a lot of barrels there. There, there is a lot of, um, you know, quarterly check-ins and things of that nature. But really these guys have been making bourbon a long time. The average experience in our, uh, in our distillery is 15 years. So really once it gets to the barrel, if there were any problems, they would identify it before then. Once it's in the barrel, they're like, okay, we can let it it's it do its thing. There's really no need to, to really check in on it um, until, you know, three or four years when we want to see kind of the trends of the Rick house and, and, you know, right. what locations are, are doing what to, to each barrel. So um, yeah. So, so it's kind of the taste it and, and bring it to their attention that you think that it's ready. Do you get a prize for that? <laughs> I wish. No, 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 no. I've definitely tasted a barrel that I thought wasn't tasting, you know, exactly right. And I remember being very concerned about it. And Nick was just like, this is just, this is just part of it. It was like two years old. He was like, wait till it's four years old. It's going to start really coming around, you know, like all those things that you're tasting won't be there in a couple of years. And he was right. Um, so put a lot of, put a lot of faith in the, the guys, uh, lead in lead in operations back there um but yeah it's i mean yeah we're, we're always checking in on the barrels that's uh that's not hard to get us to do to check in on how the bourbon is is tasting um and i just saw a question come into the uh the the comments about rotating barrels which is a great uh a great question um we do not rotate barrels at this time uh, there is a discussion of whether or not we should. Uh, I will tell you that, you know, Maker's Mark is, is a big brand that rotates their barrels because they really pride themselves in their consistency from year to year, bottle to bottle, as long as they've been distilling, right? And to maintain that consistency, they, you know, are rotating, you know, flipping the sixth row in the, in the first row, the fifth and the second and so on and so forth to make sure that everybody's getting the same fluctuation. A lot of brands like, you know, Heaven Hill or Sazerac that have really 
um, big uh, portfolios, like really like a lot of a lot of brands under their umbrella, um, are really only creating only have about three or four recipes. And they rely on those differences, on celebrating those differences to create different products. So we're kind of more on that side that we, we plan on having um, a variety of products and therefore we're okay with the in inconsistencies of you know, where barrels are located and how that's affecting their flavor. Um, so we're not rotating barrels at this point, which is um, a great question. Uh, any other questions? But another good one, we have from Fusion or Discovery Series talking about the core product. Yes, but we will continue to produce Fusion and Discovery Series, um, which will always be blends, which I'm going to talk about right after this answer. Um, and our core product will be a single recipe, right? So we'll, we'll be blending barrels, something like a small batch, but we won't be blending different recipes together like we do in Fusion and Discovery. They will continue to be there and we will celebrate that, but we'll have a different product called just Bardstown Bourbon. That will be our core product. Um, so good question, uh, good thing to clear up. Um, and speaking of fusion and discovery and blending, let's, let's get into the last two samples. So uh, the third one, we're gonna grab fusion and this is fusion series number four. So go ahead and give yourself a little pour if you have not already. Fusion, is a blend of, of young and old bourbon. The name itself, Fusion, is referring to the fusion of young and old. Uh, and uh, please you know, smell, taste, let us know in the, in the comments and when we open it up, uh, what you guys are tasting. But Fusion is, Fusion series number four, Nick's got this slide pulled up on the screen for y'all to see. Um, it has four different Kentucky straight bourbons in it. Three of those are produced and aged by Bardstown Bourbon Company between three and four years old. And the three of those bourbons together make up more than half of the blend, uh, 60% to be exact. And then we're blending that with a 13 year Kentucky bourbon that we source. And we really feel like blending young and old together. I, I'm gonna geek out for a while on Fusion because I, I think it's incredible, and I think it's it's often I, I, not given the hype it deserves. In in a way, it definitely gets a ton of hype. This was a uh, whiskey advocate's number eleven whiskey in the world in in 2019. Um, but it's easy to look at price points and say, well, that one's more expensive. It must be better. Fusion is absolutely delicious in my mind, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's really taking on a lot of attention for the art of blending, which is so kind of a uh, taboo in American whiskey culture still, very mm -hmm. much respected and celebrated in other whiskey cultures and in wine and in cognac and in so many other spirits because it's great that we have these, these single barrels out there that are magical and delicious and, and unicorns, if you will, but I think it's really impressive when you can create that kind of unicorn flavor profile with the skills and the art of blending and, and the, 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 the fine tuned palettes that are, that are assessing and deciding what to be blended together. I think that's incredible. And I think it's gonna be the next biggest trend, maybe not right away, maybe in five years, uh, we're gonna start seeing uh, blends being a little bit more hyped up uh, than single barrels, right? So when you're blending young and old together, you can really create something very complex. And that is my biggest word that I use to describe fusion. It's complex. It's not complicated. It's easy drinking, but there's a lot sure. going on in it. With younger bourbons, as we just tasted that three year that we all thought was delicious, right? You get these Sort, you sort of get these more delicate flavors that when they're left in the barrel for too long, uh, get overwhelmed by the barrel character. I'm sure a lot of you here have had um, some really well-aged bourbon that's just like, like just, just barrel, like it's all you get, right? And, and that's great and delicious, but there's a lot of these like delicate fruity notes, floral aromas, um, brighter flavors that are on younger bourbon. And when you can blend those with an older bourbon, you can still kind of, kind of maintain those, those delicate notes and just kind of 
uh, blend them in with those richer notes from an older bourbon. So you get all of those things on one taste. And it's interesting. It's transitional. It's, it, it's you know, you take a sip and the first thing on your lips is completely different than the last thing on the finish. And I really enjoy that. It's a bourbon that makes me think. And uh, with series four in particular, um, it has our, our oldest bourbon that we've blended in into a product yet. It's got some four year in it. And there's this kind of like magical, like amaretto-esque kind of finish on it, like almondy, mm -hmm. nutty sweetness, uh, but baking spices and caramel and everything that you expect in a good bourbon as well. 94.9 um, proof, non-chill filtered. So it's got all those nice oils uh, that give it all that great flavor. Um, what do you guys think? Let's hear. Let's hear from you guys tasting it. What do you guys think about this one? So Sam, I got introduced to Bardstown about a little over a year ago, and when it came to this series, uh, the Fusion series, I, I was really, really blown away. And this Fusion Four has actually been one of my go-to bottles to buy lately. Uh, it's something about it that it, it just hits on so many different levels. So easy to drink not overpowering, not lackluster. And you, you get this, for me, I get this on the nose and the palate, I get this kind of bacon spice, black cherry tartness thing going on that is just out of sight. And for people to sleep on it, it's, it's you're really being foolish. Uh, Cause I was kind of this, what you were talking about, oh, it's a blend. Ah, yeah, I know. You know, it has to suck. It's a blend. Nobody blends. Well, you guys blend and you blend beautifully. And uh, the Fusion series, once again, it's, I keep a few bottles at the house just because I like to keep extras of stuff I really enjoy. And this is definitely a year ago, I, I kind of went into this uh, a little apprehensive. Who's this young company? they're blending whiskey oh my god this is gonna suck and then i tried it i'm like i don't know nothing about whiskey anymore this is really freaking good it just <laughs> blew blew my mind and when we were in kentucky with some really dear friends of ours uh they were all the same way we're sitting at mammy's uh, uh restaurant down in bardstown and we're talking about blended whiskeys and i'm like you you have to try it you you got to go in with an open mind. I promise you, if it sucks, I'll buy you a Pappy 23 or something. Uh, so they all, they all tried it and it was like, wow, just totally straight up Kentucky bourbon people, straight up like old school whiskey people. And they were blown away by how robust and just so much going on. So once, once again, just a fantastic job, but this one right here, Fusion 4, excuse me it is simply just a magnificent bottle and if you get a chance to say it definitely pick it up or i will just, just um and to what chad had to say there everybody that was with us when we were down there were uh um kentuckians they were born and raised in kentucky and weaned on kentucky bourbon so uh that, that should tell you something I, I want to throw it over to Robert Diana here. I'm going to call him out here. He's our whiskey reviewer for uh, Whiskey Network magazine. So I, I'd like to get his professional opinion on this, and, and I'm going to back out, and then everybody else can ask what they want. Thanks, Bill. Actually, I, I, I was thankfully ready to act, comment on this one, um, and I will call out Chad on not liking blended whiskey. Um, I, one of my favorites we actually both agreed on was – uh, so, uh, chapter three of Booker's Little Book, which it really did change my mind on blended bourbon um, or blended American whiskey, I should say. But with this, and, and my notes are actually very similar to Chad's, it, it's, you get that cinnamon, you get the baking spices. There is a significant amount of barrel char still here, but it's a nice level of smokiness that doesn't overpower things. I'm a big fan of black cherry when you get it. Um, and this definitely sits there and it, it just lingers for a while. Um, I also really like, contrary to what seems to be popular opinion, is that almost almond-like finish, which 
is reminiscent for me of Four Roses Small Batch, um, because that it's very different flavor than you that you get compared to your typical, you know, caramel vanilla, maybe a little smoked bourbon, you know, and, and being a little bit different in that sense is is a great thing because it really does make you stand out. Um, and a lingering nuttiness is just I, I find it so much fun with with the flavors that you get here. You know, it's it's just really interesting. I, I'm a big fan. There is no doubt. Thank you. Uh, and I do need to mention before I forget that because it just came in on the comments too, that these are done as a series, right? So uh, this is series number four. And what you see on the shelf right now is all that's left. So if you see it, grab it. Fusion 5 is going to be coming right behind it as our first product that we uh, bottled our own too, as we just launched our own bottling line two days ago, three days ago. Um, so yeah, if you guys like Fusion 4, buy a bottle uh, before it's gone, uh, but also know that uh, coming right behind it is going to be an, another incredible blend, uh, which uh, is on screen right here for you to check out. So oh, a four-year, a three-year, 11-year uh, blended uh, with mostly Bardstown product. And this is, this is delicious. It's that's just in line with expectation of quality as anything else under the Fusion series. So um, yeah, uh, any other questions about Fusion before we get to the grand finale? And when, uh, when, uh, actually, quick, I'm sorry. When you guys, when you're picking barrels for these kind of things, are you looking for flavor profiles that are convergent? So you're actually accentuating certain traits or are you looking for divergent flavor profiles to create different traits? So it could be a little bit of both uh, and that's, I, I like that you asked that question because uh, what we're really looking for is the best tasting blend. And the way that we come up with that blend is very unique and very collaborative. Uh, so when I started with the company, I started before there was a brand, before there was product, before there was a restaurant, tours, any of that, um, as part of the group that helped open up all of those things. And um, when it came time to, to talk about, you know, blending a product, our, our leadership at the time was like, listen, we, we have all these very different skill sets and professionals under the same roof, right? And that, that makes us different, you know, that we have these culinary professionals, these mixologists with a uh, great, you know, just great palettes for, for cocktails and, and why not? why not use all of their perspectives and all of their expertise when it comes to what our bourbon should taste like, right? So what started with from day one with our very first product that we released and what we still do today is we ask anybody that works in our company that has, you know, that A likes bourbon and B is interested and willing in, in blending bourbon, we give them a uh, you know, a, a list of parameters and a, a set of different barrel samples to blend with. And we say, come up with your best blend. And once they have that blend, they submit it to our VP of product development, Dan, Danny Bardstown, and he'll blend all of these up and schedule these blind tasting panels with a, a select few of us, about a dozen or so of us over the course of a few weeks, we'll taste maybe three or four a day blind and I'll almost put them in like a tournament bracket, right? So we're gonna meticulously score them on tasting experience, nose, palate, mouthfeel, finish. And the best ones will move on until we get down to one blend that we're gonna bottle. So uh, we've, we've made it clear from the beginning that we don't really want to limit ourselves too much by painting too many lines that we have to stay within. We're just looking for the best blend possible. Obviously with Fusion, we have, you know, the young and old concept and we have, um, you know, keeping the, the blend heavy on our younger product as, as a parameter. Outside of that, flavors, flavor profile, proof, anything, we just want it to be the best tasting experience possible. And I think it's really cool that you can get some really, really different flavor profiles, but still that, that same expectation of quality um, in all of these blends. And we've had a lot of different representation of who's gotten blends in the bottle. 
Um, so Chef Stu, uh, our executive chef, the, the man uh, that makes all the magic happen in our restaurant, blended Discovery 4, which we're going to try. Uh, Vince Metcalf, one of our tour guides and, and Bardstown locals, who's 25 years old, uh, blended Fusion 4 uh, that y'all are tasting. So it's, it's a process that we think is, is successful um, and one that we, we celebrate, you know, and it not only does it make a great product, but uh, it creates really good company culture. And I'm sure the, the, the folks here that came out to the distillery really noticed you know, I just, just how excited every individual in the building that works for us is to be there and to, to talk to anybody about the product. And I, I really, really am so thankful and, and commend the, the people that started the company for building that into our company culture because it, it makes a great product. Uh, and Sam, um, obviously where we just spoke about Chef Stew and Discovery Forum, we'll get onto tasting that in a minute. Um, uh, just to let everyone know, so Sam herself, I know she's always modest with this one, but for those of you who have got Discovery 3 at home, um, that's Sam's blend. Um, she was the one that was um, that won that award. So obviously as a young female in the whiskey world and having su such a successful whiskey, I think, yeah, definitely. Thanks, it's Nick. It's incredible. Yeah, I hope it's not the last time, but, you know. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to beat you to it. <laughs> yeah, I hope it's not the last time I get a blend in the bottle, but uh, we'll see. Uh, so th thanks for the shout out. Uh, so yeah, um, I hope that I was kind of a lengthy answer. I'm sorry uh, for going off on a tangent, but no worries. Uh, uh, if you ever want to try a really good candy with that particular bourbon, yeah. cherry sours. Cherry sours. Oh, yeah. Okay. I Trust really it. am. I'm really into unconventional uh, pairings. <laughs> So I, yeah, I, I love that. Uh, I'll give it a try and let you know. You gotta drink it and then eat them. Okay. I would you like to compliment uh, Bardstown on their collaborative efforts because as Sam said, the culture there is just unbelievable. Nothing like I've Absolutely. ever experienced anywhere in my entire life. Everybody is so happy to work there and happy to work together. It's just something you have to experience. I can't put it into words. It's just an unbelievable company to walk into and visit and experience. Thank you. Thank you. You definitely see the love out of every, the janitor was like, so talkative to me. I'm like, I'm yeah. going to the bathroom, buddy. He's like, oh, you gotta try the Bardstown discovery. I'm like, oh. you, you know, but no, it, yeah. What Bill said is 100% accurate. It is, was really mind blowing to see how excited everybody was. And that energy really fed us in there. And it was like, we were excited because they were excited. Everybody's excited. It was awesome. Listen, I, I have a, a somewhat unpopular opinion that, um, you know, people, people ask me all the time, like, what's your favorite bourbon? you know, outside of Bardstown Bourbon Company, you know, when they, you know, are looking for a, a more personal answer. And the truth is, is that there are so many freaking good bourbons out there. At, mm -hmm. And and I really don't think there's any one that has ever, I've ever gone like, oh man, I'd pay a thousand dollars for a pour of this, right? Like there's none that you have spicy ones and you have sweet ones, right? And you definitely have your preferences. And there's, there's so many good bourbons out there that like, I just... I really don't think that one's just gonna blow any other one out of the water, but what does make a difference and what, what speaks to that anecdote that you just shared is, is how much bourbon and spirits in general can trigger nostalgia and, and good experiences. And that's, that's the whole point of what we do by offering this, this hospitality forward mentality um, by, you know, bringing people to the distillery and, and showing you our people and making you feel like family and, and friends in our home is because that's, that's when people reach for a bottle again. Like I, I, I love seeing, making a, a great experience over a, a poor bourbon with somebody because the next time I see it on a back bar or I see it on the shelf, I'm going to grab that bourbon because it makes me think of those great experiences that I've, I've, I've made and the memories that I've made. And so my, my favorite bourbon will forever be Bardstown Bourbon Company because of all the good memories that I've made. And that's why, that's, that's why I'm here. That's what Nick is here for. That's what Steve was there for when you guys came to visit is to, 
like we make good bourbon. We're confident in that. We want to make good memories so that you get excited the next time you pick up a bottle of Bardstown Bourbon Company. So I, you know, that's important. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that, that actually makes me want to ask this question. Uh, while Bill and I were driving down to Kentucky and we're going over different things, we, we had a really busy weekend down there. And of course, being down in Bardstown Bourbon Company, we were there all day long uh, from nine o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. Um, of course, we're coming down there to host a live Zoom. And so we wanted to know more about Bardstown Bourbon Company. And as you were talking about the hospitality, the experience, uh, that just made me think. Uh, one of the things I was reading about the distillery was they wanted, they envisioned a Napa Valley experience for the uh, Kentucky Bourbon Trail. And I'm like, what the hell are they talking about? me and Bill were discussing and when we arrived there, I totally got it. I totally got what that was saying. Uh, would you care to tell the people that are thinking about going to the Bardstown Bourbon Company, the Napa Valley experience on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail? Yeah, so it was definitely something that, you know, these, when you go out to Napa, you have this not just you don't just see the production you you eat you have lunch you you do tasting you hang out you stay on site you know you you really don't just kind of tour and taste and and get out of there you you spend time in in the agriculture of it and then in the communities right so that's what we wanted to bring to bardstown because bardstown Kentucky is still kind of off the radar for a lot of people. And what people don't know is that's the bourbon capital of the world. Uh, and it's not a very big town. It's, it's a rural town. And that's why we have the distilleries there because we have the land, we have the, the corn, the space, all, all of those things. And we really wanted to, you know, not only, you know, bring people out to see us, but bring people out to see the community in the town because it has so much to offer. So you know, uh, the bar and restaurant are are uh, unlike what you would expect in a rural K Kentucky town, but with all of honoring all of Kentucky's traditions and, and cultures, right? So uh, we want people to not just come and, and tour and buy a bottle and leave. We want people to stay and, and hang out with us and really just immerse themselves into the the bourbon culture that that we have there. We have 11 different uh distillery experiences in in uh bardstown um and a lot of bourbon and and we're we're about building community there that's why also when you sit down in a restaurant or at the bar you won't just see our bourbon you see everybody's bourbon we've got maker's mark we've got jim beam we've got barton we've got everybody because we're hospitality driven you know we're not trying to turn anybody away if they don't want to drink our product that's fine we just want you to come hang out make good memories there um and it sounds like you guys did when you guys were out so that's oh my great God, that was beautiful and he also got a really kick-ass room that john is sitting in yeah. Uh, yeah yeah tons of uh three to four hundred different antique whiskeys um Crazy so that whiskeys. is our our vintage library and it is um just an incredible room to, to be in and, and hang out in. It's, it's literally being surrounded by American history, right? Because whiskey, you think about where all those bourbons came from. I mean, we could do a separate Zoom about just that room oh, uh, because- We, we would need so, a week long Zoom. It's so cool, like how much that affected how our country was built and our government and our democracy for the whiskey rebellion and, and all of those things. It's it's incredible how embedded bourbon is in our culture. Um, so uh, yeah, that's an awesome background, John. I, I bet it'd be real cool if you were actually in that room and not just using it virtually. <laughs> so we'll have to make that, that happen. Is again. that part of the regular tour? I'll be there in September, just curious. <laughs> I'm a, I, I might be the only person in this entire group that ha that is, is, for the most part, a bourbon noob. I'm, I'm my background's in Scotch whiskey, and so I, I I'm pretty cool. new to the bourbon world, but I really like uh, I really like what what you're doing, and and this has made me excited more excited than I was before because because Bardstown is on the the trip, and I'm excited to come visit and learn. 
definitely, you know, let Nick know when you guys are coming out. Um, oh, I think I'm sorry. I think I'm freezing up here and there. I can, I can see and I'll, I'll pause and wait till I'm back on. Uh, but you can book some experiences in the Vintage Library um, on our website, farsonbourbon.com. Go to tours. They do book up pretty far ahead of time. If you have some trouble, um, you know, reach out to our, our buddy, Nick. He'll see what he can do, but definitely plan ahead as much as you can and, and get in uh, for, for an experience and uh, a meal and you won't regret it. But it is nine o'clock and we haven't tasted the last one yet. So if, in case anybody's got some things that they need to get to, uh, let's get to the last sample and, and taste that and talk about that. So that's gonna be our discovery series. And this is series number four, as I mentioned, you know, explains the, the blending process. This, this, the blend that went into this bottle was Chef Stews, who is an incredible chef uh, leading our culinary program. Uh, this is 115 proof, and it is a blend of three different Kentucky straight bourbons um, that are all from different producers. So all of them are really well aged. There's a 10 year, a 13 year, and a 15 year that went in here. So obviously being four and a half years old, none of this is Bardstown juice. But what we're celebrating here is you know, that really even more, almost more so than, than fusion, diving into the art of blending. Because you look at the age statements on, on this bottle, 10, 13, and 15 year bourbons here. Uh, hard to find these bourbons, right? And any of these bourbons stand alone as great freaking bourbons, right? Like they are incredible to drink by themselves, but we wanted to put our stamp of, you know, uh, of, of, of craft on it. Um, so we're blending and I got to tell you, it's, I, I really, when we come together to blend fusion and discovery, I really geek out with discovery because I think it's challenging to blend with incredible bourbons and make something that's even better. Right. Cause what's the point of blending it if that 13 year tastes better than the blend on its own. Right. So that's the goal. Right. And uh, I think Chef Stu nailed it on, on this blend by creating, I don't know if anybody here uh, really identifies themselves as, as a rye bourbon lover or like a spicy bourbon lover. Anybody here like the, the spicy bourbons? Yeah, this is, this is spicy to me. And for uh, all the age on it, surprisingly fruity too. You get like some black cherry, some fig or plum notes, something kind of darker and richer. Um, and for 115 proof, really really drinks pretty well. Uh, and if you aren't 115 proof ready, uh, throw some water in it, throw some rocks on it. It drinks really well that way too. Um, what do you guys think about how it smells, tastes, feels? I've been nosing this glass for the last 10 minutes and uh -huh. it's amazing how it morphs. I, mm. I get something different each time I lift it to my nose. I, I get oak, then I get vanilla, then I get caramel, then I get black cherry. It, it, it's amazing. It, and I haven't even tasted it yet. It's I'll taste really, it. I, I think this is one of the, <laughs> the most well-balanced bourbons that I've, I've tried because like with the nose, the palate and the finish, it, it's just very consistent throughout. And I love the way that the finish, it's not a super long finish, but it's just enough to where you can really appreciate it. <laughs> See, I think the finish lasts a very long time. It, it, it mellows, but it just really stays there and lingers. And it's, I, I get the same thing. Nick said it in the chat. Right, it's absolutely. Kentucky hug. I love so, you. Uh, haven't eaten Chef Stew's food, and I really wish he'd send me that damn lamb kebab recipe because it was so <laughs> darn good uh this one is one of my other ones i really really enjoy but unfortunately you just don't see it no more um i got a sneak peek of what's to come with it and i can't wait uh yeah oh my god it's so crazy good this is just you got craziness going on in this glass i don't want to give too much away about this one 
I'll, mm-hmm. I'll let everybody else talk because I could go on for about an hour on this one, and so I'm just going to drink. Yeah, so I was I was actually in um, Kentucky a few weeks ago on a business trip, and I was in a place, and they, they I had the three, loved it, and they happened to get the four in that day. And to Chad's point, I'm not a blended guy. I look at that kind of stuff with with contempt, as a lot of people do in the bourbon world. But the person said, you, you've got to try it. And I went on a limb and bought it. And it's spectacular. Awesome. So, We'd love to hear that. The- hey, like that. Uh, something I didn't uh, mention, uh, but I'm sure many of you are already aware, is that, you know, right on the side of the bottle, we put all those mash bills, age statements, mm-hmm. where they're produced and, and how much of each is in there. So that's that transparency on the label that I've referenced um, a time or two, right? Um, and it's it's crazy how unique that is, right? And I honestly think if everybody was transparent, you'd see a lot more blended products out there. Uh, they just they just don't celebrate it. They don't talk about it. Um, and, and we're changing that up, right? And it's great to hear people change their minds. That's, that's amazing uh, because we all have hard opinions about things that we love and are passionate about, right? And to, mm-hmm. to taste something that you typically would have been like, that's not my cup of tea. I know that about myself. I'm, you know, I'm a bourbon drinker. Uh, and then to, to be pleasantly surprised is, is the goal. Uh, so we, we love hearing that. Um, and, and as Chad mentioned, this is almost impossible to find anymore. The word is out. It's not a secret anymore. We're not, you know, as, as, as up and coming as, as we used to be. Now we're there, right? So people are aware of Discovery Series. They're trying to get their hands on it as quick as possible. Um, so when you see it, you got to pick it up. And when you see the next series, series number five, pick that up. Buy it's it. just as just delicious. It. Yeah, Take it's my word very, for it. very it. good. Don't, don't buy uh, it. Buy it for me. Here's uh, on screen uh, what we're looking at. So we've got some of the oldest bourbon uh, that we've ever blended with, a 17-year, uh, with some 13-year, some 7-year, and some 6-year. You know, that 17-year is incredibly well aged. Um, and we did have to kind of start to pepper in some slightly younger bourbon just to just to kind of keep it all balanced. Like, uh, I forget who said it, but, it, you know, inc- Discovery 4, incredibly balanced, so drinkable at 115 proof. And that's part of it, the thought process, right? Is, 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 you know, Frankensteining that perfect flavor profile. And with every series, we have to approach that differently uh, with, you know, what bourbons we have to blend with. And I think Discovery 5 might be the best one yet. So um, what do you guys think? What's the ETA? That that thing's going to be uh, one in golds. I think, uh, oh, and speaking of golds, Discovery 3 and 4 uh, just announced San Francisco Spirits competition, one double gold. So that is, um, with our first with our first uh, product release with Fusion 1 and Discovery 1, we actually did not enter the San Francisco Spirits competition uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but with Series 2, 3, and 4 of Discovery, all double gold winners, right? Incredible. Uh, and I think Discovery 5 is going to be right in line to do the same. Somebody asked about ETA. Yeah. Uh, we do plan to bottle it um, the second week in June. Um, so it should be uh, just a couple weeks after that. So hopefully by the end of the month in June, but definitely by July, you'll see. Uh, I think that's, I, I got to let Nick kind of answer that question too. He's nodding. Okay. Um, so uh, n- right around the corner, right around the corner, you're going to see Discovery 5 and Fusion 5. Um, so please pick those up and let us know uh, what you think about those when you taste those. Um, you got, do you all sell them at the, uh, at the distillery? Yes, we will sell them at the distillery until they're sold out, right? So right, sure. we'll, we'll, Very you know, we'll do a press release, you know, a public, uh, you know, social promotion and, and all of that sort when it hits the gift shop. And then people come in stampedes. Um, so we'll have it until it sells out, which is both a good problem and a problem, yeah. right? <laughs> when it when it sells out. But uh, the good thing is, is we've you know, we've got 
we've got a lot of uh, cool products coming out all the time. Uh, and the one product I did not mention because it's not in the tasting kit is our collaboration series. And I know I, I saw several questions in the comments about that earlier. So our collaboration series is the most limited product that we do just by the nature of how we produce them. Um, so everything under the collaboration series is a finished whiskey, a finished bourbon whiskey to be exact. And we will take a bourbon, an aged bourbon, something that we source with some good age on it. And we will finish it in used barrels that previously held wine, beer, or another spirit. And the reason these are causing such a, a craze and building such a hype is because these are premium. These are luxury finished whiskeys. And, and that's kind of kind of different for the category because typically when people finish a whiskey, it's because they have really young juice and they need to sell something. Uh, so they, they put it into a used barrel and they, they sell it as a finished whiskey. That's a lot of young producers who, you know, as we mentioned, need to, you need to make some money for investing in that really expensive distillery, right? That's, that's often the case, not always, but often um, where we're taking premium bourbon to begin with. And then we're going into premium spirit brand barrels. So another thing that you don't see from finished whiskeys typically um, is anything that tells you where the port came from or where the rum came from, right? Well, wouldn't that be worth celebrating if it was something good? So we celebrate it on every collaborative bottle. We don't just say finished in wine. We're finishing in the prisoner red wine blend barrels, right? So you know we're starting with quality. Um, and putting it into quality barrels. And we finish them for 18 months, which another thing you don't see very often is anybody that tells you anything about how long they finish for. 18 months is, is unheard of. It's 18 months that you're not making money on it, but it's 18 months that it's pulling all of that residual spirit from the inside of that barrel as it's gonna get 18 months, it's gonna get that full climate swing. It's gonna go into the barrel, grab that residual spirit, and pull it back into solution while it's getting extra time in oak. And it's just an incredible product. So hard to find. You gotta get to know your, yeah. your liquor store owners and ask them yes, when it's do. coming in. That's that's the best way to, to get in line for a collaboration. Um, Prisoner is out right now, although probably selling out really fast. Um, and then we do have, we release about three a year. Uh, so we do have some coming out um, later in August, September, I think is when the next one will be released. Um, and somebody specifically asked about Chateau de la Baud. This just won a best in class and a double gold at the San Francisco Spirits competition to nobody's surprise. I've never seen so many people upset about us not having more of a product than with our, our release of Chateau de la Baud. So we immediately bought more Armagnac barrels and have bourbon rusting in it currently. Although I don't think it's on the bill to release this year because it only, it, we got to finish them for 18 months, right? So I think that's scheduled to release next spring if everything goes to plan. Um, so we are, uh, yeah, we, we are trying to produce more of it too, but we're also opening more markets. So more product, but also more markets to spread it around. Um, so a couple that are coming out later this year, we are doing um, a, a bourbon finish in plantation rum barrels, which I'm really excited about. We have one uh, with Pierre, uh, Maison Ferrand Cognac, which uh, is tasting incredible. Got to check in on that one myself. We've got one with Founders KBS barrels, uh, right? The Kentucky barrel aged stout yes. that they release seasonally. We have a bourbon finishing in, in those barrels that taste incredible as well. And it's kind of hard to tell you exactly which one is going to come out because it's it's definitely like taste and see if it's ready sort of deal. Um, but those are some that we have in the pipeline right now that we're excited uh, to to release when they're ready. Um, Nick, any so anything? Will there be, Go ahead. Will there be any more with a uh, Pfeiffer Pavit? Pav Pavit? So just it's in discussion right now. Um, okay. I, it's it's looking but, like we'll do we'll do a third run, but I can't I can't say for sure. So don't quote me on that. Yeah. We were able to try that, and it was such a. I must like uh, finished bourbons because I've been enjoying so many of them lately. Uh, the Pfeiffer Pavit was just a beautiful marriage 
Yeah, I happen to have a half a bottle of that in my cabinet that was gifted to me by a wonderful gentleman. Nice. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Ah. Right uh, that was the one we opened on the tasting night, right? Yes, correct. Oh, that's so yeah. great. You're welcome. Um, so other products wise, um, so even though Sam's mentioning what we've got, the reason why we can't actually tell you uh, what we're going to be releasing at the end of this year is because we don't know if the whiskey is going to be ready yet. And that's the bottom line. Uh, if the whiskey's not ready, we won't come up with a third release this year. Um, we, we won't let, um, and I work on the sales and marketing with uh, Sam, uh, with, that's our umbrella. Until we can all agree and the distillers and, and um, all our ops team decide as one, as a whole entire company, if the whiskey's not ready, the whiskey's not ready and we're not gonna, just going to release it just to try and make that dollar. Um, it, it's let the whiskey uh, tell, uh, tell us when it is. So we'll go from there. And it's the same with like, uh, like obviously the question came out of Chateau de la Borde, 18 months from when we released it and then about, it was about a month after we first released it. And it's as simple as that. Yes, it's wonderful that we could probably try a little bit earlier. Um, if, it, if it's good at 15 months, then we might see. But if it's not good at 18 months and we have to push it back to 20, then we'll do the same. And that's one thing I actually love about the integrity of all of our products is not just trying to sell it for the dime. It's about selling it for the experience, selling it for those uh, different wonderful whiskeys. So well, sorry, everything yeah. uh, I've gotten the experience with the Bardstown Bourbon Company has just been over the top, great. Um, so I highly recommend everything Bardstown Bourbon Company. Get down there, see the distillery. It will really change your mind of distillery tours and drink the, drink the whiskey because quite frankly, it's probably some of the better stuff out on the market today. And uh, it's just been a pleasure getting to know it. And I thank you guys. Thank you all for doing what you do. So, yeah, um, there is one last question that came up on Facebook um, from uh, one of the um, uh, Whiskey Network writers um, from Mark Pewitt. Um, it's, and Sam, this is director, the, directed at you. In your role, you've interacted with a lot of people. Um, can you share a story about seeing a particular tough critic uh, uh, convert over to a really loving your products? Uh, this seems to be a common theme uh, that people try this and really get hooked? That's, uh, that's a great question. And, and it's hard to really give um, a specific example because it happens all the time. It's not a unique thing. Um, so bourbon is, you know, a, a traditional spirit, right? And, and people have definitely, like I said, you know, found out what they like and stay within those lines. And I think above anything else, the, the the finished whiskeys, I've seen so many people go, well, that's not a bourbon. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I know, I know it's not a bourbon. I know that, you know, the second it goes into a used barrel, it's technically not a bourbon. But why miss out on this great experience to taste something amazing? Like just taste it. And as soon as they taste it, I would say more than nine times out of 10, like 98% of the time that person goes, oh my God, I was not expecting that to be that good. Um, so that's, that's definitely a, a common reoccurrence uh, so often that I, that's probably happened today as I was at the distillery all day today. Um, and that's great. It's also great when they don't want to give it a try because you know what, more for you guys to go around. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I do think that as the bourbon boom continues to grow and bourbon communities continue to grow, people are becoming much more open-minded. We're getting a lot more of different types of bourbon drinkers too. Um, and, and, and just more ways to enjoy it. So, uh, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have like a really great story about one bonehead, <laughs> but it, it, it's, yeah, it's common. It happens all the time. And, it's one of the most rewarding things being, especially being out in the market as much as I am in, you know, DC or in Texas or wherever I am. I, I love, I love a challenge. I do. I love that grumpy old guy that doesn't think I <laughs> know what I'm talking about. I'm going to tell him that he's going to love it. And I don't need to get worked up about it because 
I, I love catching people when they smile too. I like to call them out on it because people will get very serious when they go to drink their bourbon. And then I see it and they don't even realize that they're doing it. But I've seen so many times somebody take a sip and then smile. And then I go, I caught you. I was like, you just smiled. And he was like, oh yeah, you're right. That is really good. And like, that's just, that's the best feeling in the world. And that makes awesome. uh, my job very awesome. And um, last that's question so cool. for you, Sam, before we wrap things up here. Um, sure. is um, this is from Mark Worth on Facebook. Uh, what do you guys think is the best food on the menu at Bardstown Bourbon Company in the kitchen? I'm yeah. going to say poutine. Uh, the Kentucky poutine is really good. We make it with um, Jake's sausage, which is um, a, a local thing. Jake, it makes the best sausage I've ever made but they sell his sausage around town and even in parts of Louisville now. Now I see Louisville restaurants getting Jake's sausage and using it in there, but he's a Bardstown guy. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's incredible. I'm also a big fan of um, uh, the stuffed poblano pepper, uh, just kind of a, a wild one on there, but it's, it's delicious. Uh, everything on our menu is locally sourced as much as we can, possibly can, as you know, what's provided locally. And chefs do doesn't do uh, anything but magic. So uh, you just got to get get in and, and bring a big group of friends so that you can order one of everything and share it with the whole table because it's all incredible. So we got to eat there also. And we personally, the chicken, fried, deep fried chicken, Kentucky, Kentucky fried chicken sandwich was dynamite. And if Chef Stu is listening, your lamb kebab haunts me, dude. I yeah. need the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> that was incredible. The bourbon and bites section. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, thank you for mentioning that. So that's the best way to see what Chef Stu can do is to sign up for yeah, the bourbon and bites time. experience, which is in the vintage library, right? So you got to, like I said, these book up weeks ahead of time. You got to get in there. He will do... Um, three unique bites. So it might be very elevated. I think one of them was like a scallop yeah. on like a cauliflower yes. puree and a, and a glaze, right? But it's it, always it changing. Insane. It's always changing because it's, it's meant to pair with our flight of product, right? So the nature of our product always being, you know, different releases under different series, those bites might change with series five product, right? Because they'll taste a little different. And I'll just kind of whip it up and, and taste the bourbon with you and say, this is why I made this to go with fusion. And it's incredible. So that that's the thing to do if you're really trying to see what Chef Stu is capable of, the bourbon and bites and, experience. And for anyone that is planning on going out there, I can't emphasize this enough. Where Sam says, uh, the word's out. Um, with uh, restrictions and everything else right now, we're working as uh, legally as to capacity as we can and we'll expand as we go. Um, and but with that but even with chef stew's experience in the in the vintage library we can only fit 12 people in there as you can see that it's not the biggest of rooms but it's just big enough for an intimate dinner um so right now that experience is booked out three months out oh geez. um the the tours and tastings for a group of four is about four and a half weeks out right now uh for barrel to distillate uh for saturday and uh, for, for friday night saturday and sundays um I can't emphasize enough, it, it, the word is out right now um, on what we're offering. So please do book um, if you do want to do it. So uh, other than that, so, yeah. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. So that was a lot. And so once again, go out, check out Bardstown Bourbon Company. If you haven't had it, there's a few people in here who this has been the first chance they've got. And I've been watching each of them. And it looked like they thoroughly enjoyed themselves. So on behalf of myself, Bill, Rob, we'd like to thank Sam and Nick and the Bardstown Bourbon Company uh, for this fantastic tasting event. Um, thank you for setting this up, Nick. Uh, wish you all the best with the Bardstown Bourbon Company. And you definitely are going to see them on everybody's radar. So raise a glass and remember... Crack a bottle and share a pour. Cheers, WBSE. Cheers. 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 Cheers.